Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you um, to the witnesses for your objectivity today. This is obviously terribly important. Um, Dr. Seymour, why, why does uh, the, the objective here on the Iranian side was to have a civil nuclear program? Why was it important in their minds to enrich, in your mind? Well, first of all, I don't think that's the objective of the Iranian nuclear program. I think the objective of the program is to create nuclear weapons, or at least an option to produce nuclear weapons. Thank you. So their claim to need so enrichment that was a for civil start. is just that was a, a false start to begin with. Correct. So then our, our position in, in the negotiation was to preclude them from becoming a nuclear weapon state um, forever. And so this, because of the sunsets, I think we have two problems with this deal. Number one, we allow them to enrich, and we gave that away right up front. Um, Mr. Ambassador, I, I have a question, and, and let me lead into it here. Um, you mentioned in your comment something that, that sparked a nerve here, and I want to get to it. But it looks to me like I've read this document. This document obviously does not preclude Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state um, after some point in, at some point in time. Even Secretary Kerry last week said, you know, look, they can break out after 10 or 13 years, but we'll know it. My question is, so what? You mentioned North Korea had the same position. They broke out. What do we do? The administration says, yeah, but we're no worse off in 10 years than we are today, so why not give it a shot? Well, I, I disagree with that logic. In 10 years, Iran will be much stronger than today. The question I have for you is, given the fact that we have these two problems, with the fundamental problems with the deal, the fact that we're allowing them to enrich creates all this uproar about inspections, and the second is we sunsetted it in a very short period of time. So my question, uh, Mr. Ambassador, having been through this, uh, and we have two great examples in recent history, North Korea and Libya, are we better off today to take our chances even if we had to go it along, alone with, with our sanctions, which, by the way, I'm not afraid. I'm a business guy, and I know how sanctions work. They go at companies, not countries. Uh, I am quite confident that that will not break down entirely, if we, even if we had to go it alone. But are we better off today saying no to this deal, holding out for no enrichment, holding out for longer sunsets that will, in fact, preclude them from, come, from becoming a nuclear weapon state? Or is it better to take a chance and run the 10-year clock and take our best chances? Thank you, Senator. I think everyone has agreed, or at least they have used the talking point that no agreement is better than a bad agreement. This is a bad agreement. I think you're exactly right. Iran in 10 years will be stronger. Iran, Iran has a nuclear option today. It'll have it for the next 10 years, the next 15 years, and beyond that. If Iran decides to go for a nuclear weapon, it can have a nuclear weapon in a short period of time. Maybe we can push this off a few months. Yes, it's better that Iran has a, sl a smaller stockpile of enriched uranium to 3.67 percent, better than a larger stockpile, better, than, better to have 5,000 centrifuges running than 20,000 centrifuges. Those, those are all good things, but we can't forget the nuclear option is there for Iran if it decides to go down that path. And as for containment, that's that's a great concept. It's a great concept. Well, we're going to start, you know, after this agreement to contain Iran. Okay, well, let me, let me say that to me there's a real disconnect there. We're going to give Iran access not just to the $150 billion sign, uh, signing bonus, but to hundreds of billions of dollars over the course of that 10 or 15 years. What are they going to do with this? Well, Part of it will, I am sure, improve their economy. But the Supreme Leader has made very clear that he's going to continue to support Assad in Syria. He's going to continue to support terrorism through Hezbollah and, and other sources. They're going to continue to support insurgencies within the region and fuel the Shia-Sunni uh, conflict. Iran is, a, Iran is a bad actor. We're giving them the capability, and by the way, they retain a nuclear option under this agreement. So yes, we can talk about containment, but we're feeding the beast here. Thank you. Um, yesterday we saw uh, the Iran uh, ambassador to the IAEA make a comment. <clears throat> We've seen various saber rattling by the foreign minister, by the advisor to Supreme Leader, um, on July 21st, um, Defense Minister uh, Brigadier General Hussein, I listen to the guys with stars on their shoulders, we will by no means allow any foreign authority access to our military and security secrets. I don't know how to even be any more direct than that. Uh, Mr. Albright, you've been involved in, in this before. How do you react to, to these comments that uh, obviously 
Iran is now saber rattling around what they won't do. They also said that they will not allow us to have access to these side agreements with the IAEA. I'm, I have a real problem with that, uh, particularly with some things that we've learned in the classified setting in the last 24 hours. Could you respond to, to that uh, issue yeah, about one is, I, I, I don't think you can have an agreement if Iran sticks to a position of no access to military sites. You can't distinguish between a military and civilian site when you're talking about nuclear matters, and, and the IA never has. Um, so I think that's, that's a given. Now, on, this, on the secrecy issue, Iran objects regularly. I mean, they've complained about my organization because we publish uh, what are essentially unclassified, to-be-publicly-released safeguards reports by the IA. We publish them early uh, for various reasons. Um, so Iran takes a very strict position on secrecy. The IA doesn't have to. I mean, be, particularly because of the UN Security Council resolutions on this, the international interests, they can actually do quite a bit uh, legitimately to reveal things. I think they can reveal this deal that they have with Iran, or at least aspects of it. I don't think they're bound uh, in any way by safe, safeguards confidentiality to say, no, no one can see what's in here. And, and because Iran is a special case, uh, and there's a lot of other um, political and institutional forces at play. And the background is Iran objects to everything. Every three months, it files what is essentially an obnoxious report complaining about the IA giving up uh, information about its nuclear program. And I want to emphasize a obnoxious report. And I don't say that easily. Um, and, they've, and they've certainly complained about us in that and, and many others. So I think, it, I think they have to be pushed back on this very hard. And, and the IA should be revealing much more rather than less. Well, we had that advice last week by some experts that said, look, if you go forward with this deal, you've got to enforce it in a very hard manner. Uh, so you're echoing that right now. Dr. Seymour, do you have one last comment? Yes, on the question of access to military sites, if you look at the agreement, there's no exclusion for military sites, although, although the agreement recognizes there needs to be managed access to protect uh, certain kinds of secrets. And as you said, some senior Iranian generals are saying, we'll never allow access to military sites. Who's right? We'll find out the first time the IAEA uh, requests access to a military site. If the Iranians reject it, the agreement will collapse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right.